Hi, I'm Adam Dunlap, the founder of Take Flight. What you're about to watch is a nearly two hour full access interview that I did with a tracer, documentarian, and YouTuber from England named Max Ward. Before showing you the interview, I wanted to give you a brief introduction to the video so you can understand why we're publishing this and not Max. About a year ago, I reached out to Max and I suggested he do a documentary about Take Flight and the controversies that embroiled the company from 2009 to 2015. For those of you that don't know, Take Flight grew to prominence after I founded it in 2009 and became one of the biggest brands in the poker world, worn by tracers around the world. Not only were we working with some of the most iconic historical athletes like Pasha Putkins, John Wood from Farang, Toby Seeger from Store, uh, Leo Urban, Pedro Salgado, and many others, but in 2011, I even moved to France to work directly with parkour founder David Bell. I learned parkour from him and we designed and launched his brand, which we sold until about 2015. During that time, there seemed to be endless controversies that embroiled Take Flight. There's things I did or marketing slogans I instituted in the company, rumors passed around the parkour world that caused all this drama and hate on Take Flight. And quite frankly, I never quite understood it. I understood what I did to initiate controversies, but I never understood things like why they were such a big deal, why people would cling on to rumors, um, why things that didn't hurt anybody or misunderstandings would then cause people to hate a brand for years and years. And so I suggested this idea to Max, hey, make a documentary about this. And I thought that number one, by being open to an, to an interview, it would show good faith. And then secondly, I thought that an interview from me would provide an interesting framework from which he could then go talk to other pros that were working with Take Flight during that time or other fans and customers that had perspectives on it. So he could kind of weave a cohesive picture on what the controversies were and what the different perspectives were on it. Instead, Max pretty much turned the interview into a solo hit piece. I'm virtually the only one who talks besides him and some really short snippet interviews of other pros. And it was so disingenuous and so misrepresentative of the things I said that, well, I found it quite comical, but my friends and the people who know me were really upset at the, at the video. He would literally take things I said, chop off the ends, and then make it sound like I was saying something when I was literally saying the exact opposite thing. At one point, he even puts a Nazi propaganda slogan after something I say as if to draw some sort of correlation between me and, and that regime. In any case, the thing that upset me the most was that Max Ward reneged on his promise. He promised to publish the full interview, but he didn't quite do that. He published the full interview as an unlisted video. And the only way to find it is to go to his video and search in the description. The result is that his video, titled The Most Hated Man in Parkour History, yes, that's really the title, that video has 45,000 views as of this date, June 2nd, 2024. The full interview has only 57 views. The imbalance of understanding of the situation is so egregious that I felt the full interview needed to be published. Here is that full interview. Draw your own conclusions. And if nothing else, I hope you learn a little bit about Parker's history and Take Flight's history as well. Brilliant. Yeah. So, I mean, I thought obviously your, your video um, idea came through and then I was busy working on this film next gen, but I thought it seems interesting, you know, because I have heard your name dropped in all kinds of circles and I never met you. I don't know any connection with you. So I thought best to go straight to you with it. Like I've heard everything from business genius to like absolute snake. So the, you know, the floor, <laughs> the I haven't snake. met you. I can't, I can't, um, I can't make a form an opinion. You know what I mean? So First and foremost, we're, we're gonna we're gonna talk to you and like like you said in your email, you know, um, why why do people not like you? What is this whole story? So I don't know if you want to just take us back and s sort of how did you even get into the sport of parkour? Like how did that all happen? Um, I do have a question for you before we get started. Sure, anything. Um, when I, at first I was like, yeah, you know, I proposed this idea months ago because I, I think yeah, nine months ago or something, saw your work, thought it was great. I'm like, here's a documentary guy who's making great films. There's a couple of people in the, in the parkour world that do that kind of intermittently, some mm, more seriously mm. in terms of YouTube channels. But then you proposed meeting and recording, and I wasn't sure if 
if this was like the discussion we were going to have or if it's one of multiple discussions like do you want me to go in deep dive into the details or do you want me to just ideally kind of yeah ideally like okay. i could include some of this conversation in a potential video um that's okay. what i that's what i'd hope for if that's cool with you yeah. um yeah and yeah and ideally get some details as well like um I, you know, I can talk to other people for their opinions and stuff, but I haven't really done any of sure. that yet. Uh, so essentially, I'm just coming straight to you because I'm, it's almost like oh, before God. my time, I don't know the story. You know what I mean? Like, I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've heard your name drop, heard all this stuff, but it's like, if I'm supposed to have any kind of journalistic integrity, like I need to get the story from you and just he hear it because I can see from your email, that you're clearly maybe frustrated by this, this image that's been built up of you. You know what I mean? And yeah, I don't know well, yeah. why that, that's happened either. You know what I mean? I was super frustrated. I was thinking about it last night and the thought hit me. Oh, it's in the past. Like it doesn't even matter anymore. Yeah, like, sure. It, it, so then I was like, why am I even talking to Max? Because it very much frustrated me. And I think it continues to kind of prevent some really cool stuff in the parkour world. So maybe that's the reason to talk about it. Sure. But, I think it's kind of in some ways kind of irrelevant. It's almost ancient history now, but but maybe it's not. You know, if people still talk that about me. That might be true. And, that might be true. It depends. Drop my name. Who, who's that guy who drops those? Like, um, I'm going to look him up right now on Instagram. He drops, he does like a recap. I think he's from Canada and he drops like a yeah, four Yeah, Josh Doey. Uh, like yeah, 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 10 yeah, 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 yeah. He's doing some, he's doing some really good work, um, Josh. Um, he, yeah, he, yeah. He, Puts a lot of work into those videos. I know he doesn't really make much money from him. He's a good friend of mine. What has he mentioned you on the on the show before? He's on a couple times, yeah, a couple really? times. It's it's never it's never in the positive light, and it gets really oh, under my yeah. skin, which I probably shouldn't let it. But um, anyway, that was probably one yeah. of the things that for me to write you is people like him still drop, still say negative things about me, and I'm like, come on, dude. But um, so you were like what the butt of one of his jokes or something? Because usually he's pretty positive, and he's just the only negative stuff's like jokes. Is he always he does he make a joke and use you as like a metaphor or something? Yeah, he okay. did that once, and then we were working with Evan Storm earlier this year. Oh, I love Evan, man! Legend. We were, we were trying to develop an endorsement contract with him and things like that. Yeah, and then Evan, Evan decided to. It didn't quite work out, and then you know that came up on one of on one of the shows, and Josh says something like. Oh yeah, and Evan left Storm or left take flight. You know, he's headed in the right direction. And I'm like, uh, come on, dude. I was like, That's <laughs> awesome. you know, like, be a professional. And, yeah, yeah. and why do we have to be like? I have no problem being the butt of jokes. I have a problem when somebody never says something positive about you, right? Mm. It's like if you're with your mates, right? You make fun of your mates all the time, but you love your mates, and you know that they love you and you love them, and it's just part yeah. of the relationship. Yeah. But if someone only says rude things about you you're like you're not my friend dude you're an enemy you're trying to undermine my life my reputation you're a some level of like a, a mean person you know for me in my life so that's like someone like josh like i've never heard him say adam's mm -hmm. done awesome things he's a cool guy i respect him i've never seen him say anything like that and there's a lot of people like that in the parkour world but they're like oh yeah like i don't hate adam and i'm like f you man you you've never supported anything i've done you've never said anything nice about me you've never said anything nice about my work i have screenshots of you saying really awful things about me and you're like you're just gonna forget about it because oh yeah i was 17 and it didn't matter it's like it did matter it affected my company my life and you just want to you know there's like mm. 10 or 20 guys that were really prominent in the poker world there's sort of this firestorm around me and they're just moving on with their lives, like no problem. And it's like, you don't get it, guys. Like what you did was destructive. It was unprofessional. It was unkind. I, I don't have words strong enough to explain what some of the things people said. But they're probably walking around in their life thinking, oh, yeah, you know, whatever. I'm like, no, 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 it's not whatever, right? It's like if you're in high school and all of a sudden someone starts a nasty rumor about you. Let's say mm -hmm. you're a girl, uh, at least in the United States, in high school, it's like if you're sleeping around as a girl, you get a really bad name, right? Yeah. So let's say all the girls undermine some other girl's image, and it's not true, <clears throat> right? Okay, the other girl's like, ah, you know, it was just a rumor. We just spread a rumor. It's no big deal. But then the person that you affected, maybe it, it changed their life. Maybe it led them to depression. Maybe it affected their relationships. Maybe it, you know, maybe they're in a vulnerable place in life, and you really harmed them as a human. And it's very easy to say, oh, well, it was just a rumor, whatever. But the person that you tore down is now stuck with that image or stuck with the problems that came from that. And so what I've seen is an, an immaturity and an 
unwillingness to accept responsibility for some of the things that people did and said towards me. And like I said, mm -hmm. maybe it's all in the past. Maybe it doesn't matter. But when that thing still crops up with people like Josh and others, you think, come on, guys, like, this is stupid. Hmm. So well, in the past stupid. or not, you know, I'm, I'm intrigued because I want to tell the story because it's an interesting yeah. story at the end of the day. You know, it's like, why did this happen? What, what led to it? This and that. So, I mean, if you could get into that, like sort of your yeah, journey into parkour and, you yeah. know, and then what led into various controversies, like I know bits and bobs just from hearing it around, but it does seem before my time. And I'm not one of the said, like you said, like 15 sure, sure, individuals sure. that you've had real uh, issues with. Yeah. Sure. Let's see. Where do we start? Well, tw 2006, I'm in college and I had seen this thing, this, this jumping thing when I was younger. And I think it was Ripley's Believe It or Not, which you can find oh, on yeah. YouTube. There's a Ripley's yeah, Believe Ripley's, It or Not yeah. about the Yamakaze. I think I had yeah. seen that a couple of years prior when I was in high school. It had lodged in my brain. So I'm living at this Christian fraternity and I had this impulse to figure out what that was. And I asked around, I said, does anyone know this thing where people jump and over things? And someone in, in my house, a guy named Callie said, look up Yamakaze. So this is 2006. So I go to YouTube, I look up Yamakaze, I find David Bell, and I go, this is it. And so then I started doing this thing, which was parkour, which I had no idea what it was, especially in 2006 when there wasn't a lot of information out there. And especially on the West Coast of the United States where there was mm -hmm. no information. England, there was more information. East Coast of America, there's more information. But West Coast, there was almost nobody doing it. YouTube was still getting off the ground, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So anyway, long story short, I started doing this thing called parkour. Uh, and really loved it and my body transformed i went from being a really you know skinny weak guy to feeling strong and having to find muscles and such and so yeah that's kind of what started the path was wanting to be like david was wanting to be strong like david i think that's probably one of the differences for me and others was the movement wasn't as interesting to me as kind of the result of the movement the idea of becoming strong and useful that's mm. what always appealed to me was the training aspect, like the tough training, the warrior spirit, which I think is really the parkour spirit that we don't see a lot in the parkour world today. But that's yeah, what very really much the David to. Bell spirit. Yeah, very much the David Bell spirit, you know, like yeah. knuckle push ups on the concrete, <laughs> uh, you know, that type of mentality. <clears throat> so that's what really drew me in wanting to be that warrior, that 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 human being. So I started doing parkour. So, yeah, that was that. And very much did it on my own. A couple people kind of joined in, but they never took it very seriously. So for a year and a half, I just did parkour alone and literally watched David Bell videos on repeat, slowed them down to try to figure out how he would place his hands, how he would land, and then go out and try to emulate those and just try to become as good as I could become, which ultimately wasn't that good. But for the, for the time, I think I was okay. So yeah, that was the start of the journey. Cool. And then how did you get into sort of uh, the business side of parkour, let's say, because that's more where the controversy centered around, surely? 100%. 100%. If I had not gone into the business side, there's, I don't think it ever, ever would have been controversy, no mm -hmm. doubt. I got into the business side because I had an epiphany. It's kind of, so it was a weird time. So in 20, like 2006, 2007, there were lots of forums. Americanparkour.com was the biggest forum in the United States scene. I think Urban Free Flow was a big forum, but all the American guys were on the American Parkour Forum. And uh, there was also a lot of forums in each state. So there was Oregon Parkour. I think there was San Francisco Parkour. There was New York Parkour. Every, like every state had their own forum where they would talk and set up jams and things like that. So pervasive at this time was this vibe that we wanted parkour to be its own thing. And for some reason, we were all scared that big companies would come in, commandeer parkour and make it what they wanted for their own initiatives. Mm -hmm. And so with that in mind, the thought hit me. Oh, wait, I'm, there's one more thing. Wow. I'm kind of thinking out loud. The other thing was that it was also wrong to make money from parkour. So we, hit, we had two competing problems. One was that the people that have a lot of money, we were afraid that they were going to take over parkour. And then we were also against making any money from parkour. The, the idea was, well, David can make money because he's David and other people you could be in films, like if Seb, Sebastian Foucault wants to be in a film, that makes sense. Stunt work would be fine. 
maybe performing would be fine, but you're just getting into the zone of you have to be a purist. You have to be about the sport. You can't be making money. So we had these competing ideas. And I don't know if this was an English paradigm, but it was definitely an American paradigm or at least the paradigm that I adopted. Mm -hmm. And so in thinking about this, I realized, you know, we're not supposed to make money from this sport, but those the people who don't want to make money are the people who should be making businesses for the sport because they're in the right heart. They're not they're not in that greedy. Hey, I'm going to take parkour for its money. They're in the hey, I can move parkour ahead with the spirit I have for the discipline. So mm. and I you felt like you, were, you and the people you were training with were like in that group. 100%. I mean, I wasn't training with anybody. I mean, it was just it was just oh, me. Really? They were doing okay. stuff. Like like I said, like they'd kind of come and go. Uh, I had a good friend named Brian Morrison, but but um, mostly just me training myself. So basically, I didn't want. For me, let me sum it up like this: when I was when I was doing parkour at the University of uh, at uh, when I was doing parkour at Oregon State University, it was a very personal thing, a very private thing. The university newspaper came to me and wanted me to be in an article, and originally I said no because I didn't want to be doing it to be seen. It was just something, it was something for me. And because of that, I consciously did not want to ever make money from the sport. I had adopted it as something, as a personal practice that I wanted to, to do, but not something I ever wanted to turn into anything. I was very much against doing business with the sport. And then those paradigms that I mentioned led me to realize that the heart I had for the sport was the heart that should be in the people who make money from the sport because they'll always put the sport first or yeah. discipline or art, however you want to qualify it. So then I said, you know, I should do this article for the newspaper. So I did the article for the newspaper and then uh, I graduated school. So anyway, yeah, anyway, so basically I decided to start businesses. The way I started businesses was I got a job at Nike because I live in uh, Beaverton, Oregon, which is the world headquarters of Nike and got a temp job at Nike working on their world campus in 2007. And then I decided, you know, I don't want to be in a cubicle. I want to be doing parkour. So I decided to leave the job in Nike to pursue parkour. That's how I called it. Like pursue the opportunities in parkour. Mm -hmm. So for the first six months, my idea was I'm going to be a professional athlete. I'm going to become really good, train every day, nonstop, get sponsors, and then try to get an agent and then get into commercials. I figured okay. that was the way to make money, like get sponsors, get people to pay for you to live life and then get on, you know, the commercial scene or whatever. And if you do one good commercial in the United States, you can make 50 grand. And so, it, you know, in some ways it's the pipe dream, but in some ways it's a very tangible possibility. So my idea was make a way for myself with parkour. And then about six months after I started that personal journey, made a demo tape, got an agent, got some sponsors. Somebody from college asked me if I would teach her son parkour. And mm -hmm. I said, oh, yeah, I should, I, should, I should start classes. So that was how I got into the, the business world. So. Okay. So it was, it was predominantly through classes. And then when did Take Fly um, come into the equation? Take Flight came into the equation about six months later or so. Okay. So there was a lot of things now that I'm thinking about it. First of all, before I even started classes, the controversy started. That's what's, <laughs> what? wild. That's, that's so what's wild, man. This is so uh, freaking wild. It's just like, uh, back, I'm like, dude, people never gave me a chance. And I think some, some did uh, with Take Flight. That's another part. But here's the thing. So I decided I was going to start classes. This yeah. is in 2008. We're talking January or February 2008. Okay. And I go to the Oregon Parkour Forum, and I decided I'm going to start parkour classes. Now, there was a sponsor that I had, a gym called Adapt Training, and they were a movement-based gym. Before there were movement-based gyms, this was a movement-based gym, and they had, they had obstacles. They had staircases. They had railings. They had platforms. They had balance beams. They had all this cool. stuff that was like parkour taken down a notch which is kind of a good place to start for beginners and people who are older, et cetera. So it was amazing. So I went to them and I said, I want to start classes. Can I rent space from you? And they pretty much said, yeah. So we had an agreement. So I was like, sweet. So I go on the Oregon parkour forum and I write up this, 
this post that said, I'm starting parkour classes. The first date is March 8th, 2008. It's $150. Uh, I think it was an eight week course. It might've been 10 weeks, but I 10 or eight weeks. And here's how you sign up. Boom. I got insurance, got everything. And I made this post and all of a sudden the hate came and the hate was you should not be teaching classes. You shouldn't be making money. You're not qualified to teach parkour. Really wild. And I remember most prominently in the United States at the time, the prominent parkour team was the tribe, which was, I think, a 12 member team from American parkour. And it had the biggest guys in the parkour world at the time. Tyson Cheka, who had done a K-Swiss commercial with Anna Kornikova. There was Frosty, who I think was in Hawaii at the time, but of course now is a part of Tempest and well-known. A uh, guy named Ryan Ford, who started maybe the first parkour classes in the country, Apex know, Movement, which has multiple gyms. Yeah. Uh, Levi, uh, Levi Muenberg and some other guys, you know, so uh, Tyson even called me. We had a phone call and he basically said, I don't think you should start classes. So there was negatively directly on the forum. I had the most famous prominent guy in my corner of the world, Tyson Chaka saying, don't start classes. It already got a lot of hate. So mm -hmm. anyway, I moved ahead and started classes. And one of the reasons it got hate and one of the reasons it continued to get hate, this gym I started, was because it wasn't a nonprofit. And this is something I think it's hard for people to understand uh, who are in you know, parkour later now is there was so much angst. There was so much purity in the sport that making money was seen as a bad thing. Yeah. So some of the gyms that started were nonprofits. And the idea was, well, you can teach, but it has to be a nonprofit. And my thought was, you still get paid with a nonprofit. Like, wh what's the difference, right? A nonprofit, people still come to work and get paid. Like, the CEO of the Susan G. Komen Foundation makes like millions a year or something like that. You know, there's people that make millions of a year as CEOs of a nonprofit, right? It doesn't, you know, the nonprofit thing has we to We have it in the UK. Like, the, the probably the best gym, he has two locations and they're both nonprofit. And it's because they were trying to get kind of funding for them. But I yep. know the guy that runs it and I'm trying to get him to change one of them into a business so he actually owns something for his like retirement. I think he is going to do it. But no, I'm, I'm with you on that fully. There's abs like, yeah. So anyway, it got a lot of hate, but that's life. So that's, that's how it started was... was uh... I came out of the gates the first time I made a step to beat somebody. Sweet. The first time I came a step to be somebody or do something, people were like, "You can't do that. It's wrong. Don't oh, do it." And they never up. supported me. And and the guys, the Seattle parkour scene was always stronger than the Portland parkour scene yeah. until like probably a few years ago. Those guys never came to the gym, never checked it out, didn't come to the grand opening, didn't support it. They'd talk about things online like jams or whatever. They'd never reach out to me, never wanted to be involved. It was like they ostracized me. And maybe they were just autistic and antisocial. There's some argument that they were. Like, it was kind of a weird bunch. But uh, it was disrespectful. And for so all, for almost, almost that, from day one, you were just like an outsider. Yeah. Because you're training on one. your own, west of the States, you know. And then you do something. People are like, what are you doing? You know, oh, man. You didn't have people in your corner, did you? Like... No, I didn't. I didn't have people in my corner until I had students. So then okay. in spite of the negativity and the negativity started with take flight as well, which we'll get to. Mm -hmm. It was like the only people who supported me were my students. And, you know, of course, students are going to support you. They look up to you. Of course. So uh, my students have always been very good to me and always defended me to this day. But outside of that, I was kind of an outsider. And then, of course, David, you know, David Bell defended me when things got really bad years later. But mm -hmm. outside of that. Oh, yeah. And then the take flight athletes, you know, the athletes that came on board that worked with me, they uh, many of them defended me. But, you know, there was never widespread, it seemed like acceptance or defense from from the, the core of the community. You know? Yeah. So, so with yeah. take flight, you know, uh, you started this clothing brand. What was that like? Like which athletes have you had on board? You know, I'm, I'm really interested about that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Well, so I'd started the gym in March 2008. And I think a few months later in the summer somebody wrote me an email. So I was running a website called mrparkour.com okay. where I was pretty much writing articles about parkour, but more or less I was cataloging all of the parkour videos in the world, which at the time were mostly David Velp videos. There weren't a lot mm -hmm. of videos online at the time. So someone one day wrote me an email through the website and said, where can I get parkour clothing? And just like the parkour gym, mm -hmm. when someone wrote me and said, will you teach my son parkour? And a light bulb went off this email set the light bulb off. Mm -hmm. And I said, Oh, 
I should probably make parkour clothing. And what I realized is every sport has a style. Yeah. And so really parkour clothing was going to become something and nobody was doing it. You know, there's an argument that maybe Urban Free Flow had some t-shirts and I think um, Worldwide Jam had some stuff, but no one had established a clothing company. And so I said, we could be the first parkour clothing company in the world. And I want clothing that says parkour that represents my sport, but I also want, I also think that we can be a positive force in developing the style. Yeah, you know, for the sport, you know, and there was a distinct style, you know, from the following period after that, and it's it's a little bit more nuanced now, but yeah, yeah, you're totally right, and I don't I don't think really I don't think we ever developed the style, you know, GUP really was mm. huge. Yeah. I don't know if you remember them, but oh, they yeah. kind of brought on the baggy pants, yeah, yeah and yeah. then uh, was they still do the. TV? Yeah, he, he is to this day. And they still do the baggy pants. The only reason they kind of dropped off the face of the earth is the same reason most teams do. The filmmaker gets too good and starts making films and instead of parkour videos for free. So Sergio's off doing that. <laughs> but they all still train. They still train in the baggies. I was with um, Fosky a few months ago at For the Love. He's, he's coming back from some serious shit with his knee. But yeah, they still ref it. <laughs> yeah. No, he was in that competition and he did... I don't know what the move is called, but he did like this side and then yeah. just his knee. Yeah, like, he just did like a D like side flip, it. put his knee out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. oh, that's so awful. awful. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, I think I think GUP brought this style for sure. They're mm. really the baggy pants. And then Etre Four were the first ones to make really baggy pants. Mm. You know, I'm kind of from the Nike vision because that's where I grew up, and so to me, I kind of saw this professional vibe, like clean cut performance gear, and I mm. think the Parker world wanted more of the urban style, so I. I think I missed that, but that's okay. There was a period, though, like, I think it was the David Bell thing as well, though, because back in the day, the founders were all wearing, like, skin-tight stuff, so they looked fucking jacked and doing a thousand push-ups <laughs> and shit. But, yeah, I agree that it didn't really translate into the overall culture, but the, from the beginnings, like, I, I know where that came from, you know what I mean? Yeah. David loved the baggy pants, for sure, for sure. The baggy pants, but he loved the tight shirt. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's I picture, show off the I guns. I, I picture him in like a long sleeve. Maybe it's the TF one. I mean, I mean, turn around. Yeah. He's 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 his sleeves are off, mate. Look, so you well, can see the arms. Yeah, you can see that. You can yeah. see the arms. Yeah, come on. He loves yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. For he loves sure. it. <laughs> I picture I picture him. At, no, I picture him as either long sleeve or I picture him as no shirt. Like yeah, that's yeah, yeah. he loved the show. Off. That's true. That's true. That's funny. Um, so let's see. Anyway, that's a, a great man. I love. I love the back and forth. This is way more fun than me just telling a story. <laughs> no, but uh, it's 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 interesting. You know, I'm I'm really interested about the take flight stuff because it feels yeah, like yeah, let's, let's take flight has almost been like branded as this like negatively. And I not I don't know why. I used to wear take flight when I started. I started parkour in really? France. Yeah, yeah. I started with some guys who David trained. Uh, I started with Florian Bouzy, who was close with David. You might know of him. Uh -huh. Yeah, I know Florian. Uh, in, yeah. in Clermont-Ferrand, this small city. And they were wearing take flights. I was like, fucking yeah. And I, I, I bought a shitload of take flight stuff. And I, no, I, I used you to did. rep it back in the day no yeah, way, in France. Dude. Yeah, dude. Oh, that yeah. It, it, it kind of died off. Like, I moved away and then I just was wearing what people were wearing. So then I was wearing, when I was back in Sydney and like I lived in Singapore for a bit, it was Novel Ways, it was Farang, because that's what yeah. people, you know what I mean? Just, just totally. sponging, you know? <laughs> but yeah, I totally. started on take flight. Yeah, Flora and I spent a lot of time together. And I, cool. I must have given them a bunch of clothing. And of course, we sponsored Parkour Paris, so they were wearing a lot of our stuff, yeah. Thibaut yeah. and Doma. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, uh, that's so one anyway, of my as well. Yeah, sick. Oh, that's so special, man. It's like, I don't know. I don't know who, who interacted with Take Flight, who wore the stuff. It always, like, it literally warms my heart when someone's like, yeah, yeah I wore your shoes or I wore your shirt. I'm like, ah, oh, because I always feel like everyone hated us, so... Yeah, well, the thing is, negativity speaks so much louder than everything else, and so yeah, that's Doesn't just matter. life, I guess. Yeah. Um, let's get into the take fly drama. So, yeah, to summer two thousand eight, I get this letter, this email that says, "Hey, where can I get a parkour T-shirt or where can I get parkour clothing?" I don't remember exactly what it said, and I said, "Oh yeah, I should do this." So, it took me a year to figure out how to design clothing, how to print it, how to have a website. And in that time, I even went to France and met with David Bell. I think he was about 36, 37 at the time. And basically had this proposal of working together to build this clothing company. And they were, 
they said, yeah, let's do it. But they weren't really involved. So uh, June 2009, we launched the website, had six inaugural T-shirts, I think 15 total color combos. And these were things we pre-printed we, we pre -printed and had them like you could say, well, they're in the back of my car, but, you know, in our warehouse, so to speak. So there was other mm -hmm. people that were making heat press shirts. It's like, hey, buy our shirt and they take a sticker and they press it on and send you the shirt. We actually sure. like produce shirts the way Nike produces T-shirts. Yeah. And had them pre-printed and then shipped them out when somebody ordered them. So the brand, you could say, really launched June 25th, 2009. And then we were off and rolling. So I think in the beginning, it actually was received pretty well. Um, I remember I heard this story that Mark Turok, who was one of the leaders in the U.S. parkour scene. Uh -huh. Mark Turok was the founder of American Parkour. He was also the co-founder of Urban Free Flow. But then okay. easy bought him out. Yeah, people don't even know this, right? Like he oh, goes way shit. back, man. Wow. Um, anyway, so he was leading American Parkour. I heard a story from one of our athletes at the time that he had put a Take Fight sticker on his cell phone. So I think I think in the very early days, Take Fight actually avoided avoided most of the drama. Uh -huh. I think it was kind of respected. I don't think people cared that much, but it was seen as legit. And one thing we did in kind of the heart I had was we formed relationships with the parkour gyms and we'd send them money. So I remember like Ryan Ford's gym apex movement. We basically said, Hey, can we partner with you and support you guys? And they're like, sure. And so then every month I'd send them a $50 check, which wasn't a lot of money, right? It's like, who cares? It's 600 bucks a year. But yeah, the idea but, was, yeah. the idea was like the, literally the vision for the company was like, make this super mega parkour centered, all the best athletes in the world wear our gear. We make a ton of money and then we give it to everybody. Like that was the vision is like, what if we sold 10 million a year in, par in apparel and the top 50 parkour athletes all wore our gear and they all had 40 or $50,000 endorsement contracts. And all they had to do was like make videos, do parkour and wear our gear. And you mm -hmm. could see like, you could have a vision for how that idea could catch on and go viral. And then everyone's like, this is the brand we wear because they give all their money to the parkour community and build up the parkour community. So that was kind of the vision. And in the very early days, these $50 checks to the parkour gyms were a sign of where my heart was and where the vision was, but obviously it fell apart. So the drama started with domains, which ended up being. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've heard, I've heard like vague things about domains. Yeah. I think, I think the only thing I ever did wrong was the first thing I did wrong. But also, I think it was also not even a big issue, but it somehow propagated through time. And it, it, you know, it's like this anchor mm -hmm. that won't let me go. So what happened was when I started the company in 2009, I'm 22 years old or so, 22. Yeah, 22 years old at the time, I think, maybe 23. And I said, how do I get the biggest athletes in the world to work with me. And my thought was, I'm just this guy from Beaverton who has this new brand. How am I going to get Tim Sheaf, uh, you know, or any, uh, Tim Sheaf is the one name I remember for some reason, but mm -hmm. Stefan DeGru was one guy, Dan Edwards, like these guys that, that had established something that I saw as being awesome. How am I going to get them to recognize and work with me? And my idea was, I know what I'll do. I'll buy dot coms that are their name. And then one day they'll realize that the dot com is king and they'll want the domain. They'll call me up. They'll say, hey, can I have timsheaf.com? And I'll say, sure, Tim, I bought it for you and I'll give you the domain and then we'll start a relationship. Like a very naive, dumb vision, but that was truly the vision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I bought stephanvigru.com. I bought denedwards.com. I bought uh, timsheaf.com. I bought markturok.com. I was started collecting parkour domain names in about 2008, 2007, 2008. And I said, well, let me get people's .com names, like the actual names of them. And maybe that'll form a bridge to create a relationship or something, right? Sure. So 29, 2009, 2010 rolls around and I'm trying to grow the company. I'm getting anxious. Nobody's recognizing me. These big names aren't asking to work with me. So I was working with this guy and he proposed making websites on the domains. So he's like, instead of just having markturok.com, hmm. why don't you put a website on markturok.com? And I thought, that's a pretty good idea. And he said, and we could do, we could put advertisements on the website. So then when, so it could be an informational website that talks, that talks about Mark, 
when people type in Mark's name, because, you know, he's the leader of American Parkour, a lot of people know him, they'll find this website, marktruck.com. It'll be an informational website. And then you'll have take flight ads that people can click and then it'll promote your company. Right? <laughs> okay. So, like, like in retrospect, I'm like, if I, now I'd be like, that's kind of deep, yeah, yeah that's I can see, deep, I can I, see where people had an issue with that. <laughs> I know. Man. It was like, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? But I was like, okay. And this guy I was working with who, uh, who was a criminal who turned out to be a criminal actually, which speaks to maybe my poor judgment at the time. Fuck. Uh, yeah. he, he said, he, he said he would build the sites. So I was like, sweet. So he built these websites. So they're like five page websites. You, know, you go to timsheaf.com. Yeah. There's a couple photos of Tim. You have a little bio of him. And then there's mm. a page that says, you know, parkour clothing and it has take flight stuff. Right. Wow. So, so, uh, this is like a cool idea. Like, I don't know, like anyway, so, uh, obviously not a cool idea. So Mark somehow finds the website. And has a lawyer write up a two-page letter that basically says, we're going to sue you <laughs> for everything you got. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and uh, that's when I think the drama just started. And then, of course, yeah. Tim Sheaf was like, oh, my name. And then I think Dan Edwards at one point you know, wrote me and was mad about it. So that started propagating this negativity from a lot of leaders. Now, worth saying, I do think this is worth saying. What was mm. really funny about Mark Truck's letter when he was threatening to sue us, sue me, was that we had analytics on the site. And at the time he wrote me this demand letter, this his site, marktruck.com, had something like 21 total views in the whole world. Like it had it, it would have been yeah. up for like three months or something. It had 21 total site visits and 19 site visits had happened in the day or two before he sent me the letter. Right. Which, which means it was just him and his lawyer, like going to the site a bunch and looking it up. Right. Yeah, so yeah. it had like, it had something like two site visits that weren't him. And, uh, I think the average site time of those visits was less than two seconds. So yeah. <laughs> it was like, it was like Google crawlers or something that visited the site. So like nobody saw the site I'm talking like, there's probably not a single person on the planet that has a memory of seeing that yeah. site. Size no mark, right. Same with Tim <laughs> Same with Dan Edwards. So like, yes, Adam, like I'll take responsibility and say I screwed up on this one, but I, I didn't hurt anybody. I didn't yeah. do anything wrong. Like I didn't cost anybody money. I didn't harm anyone's reputation. I didn't, I, there was literally nothing that happened from the site. And yet this started this snowball that started to pick up speed. So yeah. that was the thing that happened. Um, let me, uh, set up a new Zoom call because it's going to kick me off in four minutes. <laughs> We back. We back. Oh, yep. mate. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, has been a while since I've done this and they changed their policies. So if we do go over 40 minutes again, we just stop it like just at the end and then it'll just, you know what I mean? Anyway, fuck it. Okay. Happens. <laughs> you were, yeah. yeah, you just said about how Mark and those guys sued, were suing you over the fucking domains. No one watched them. That's probably about where we... That's yeah, where we got to. I think that, I think that was the first controversy that, that got us on the wrong foot. I think okay. that li that literally propagated for the next five or six years, okay. and I think formed the foundation of people being able to say Adam's a snake or mm. he's all about the money and you know he's using other people's names to sell his products and things like that. And this brings up an interesting point that I can empathize with the people that didn't like me. Right. I understand. I think I, it's weird. I think I can understand why people drew some of the conclusions they did, mm -hmm. but that at the same time, I don't understand it because it seemed excessive. Right. And I tried to explain myself many times and people wouldn't listen. So I don't think I, I, I still don't really understand the hate and negativity that surrounded me. That being said, I can explain the things that I think led to it. So it's this weird situation I'm in where I don't quite understand it, but I think yeah, people like to bandwagon on stuff. It was the same with when, like, when Fig came in. It's like, all right, we can see a lot of potential negatives here, but there's, you know, they haven't done any of this stuff yet. Essentially, it's just a huge amount of money coming into the sport. Do you want to just see what what the situation is first? You know what I mean? And then there are they have done some negative stuff, but there are still positives. They're still paying like 
athletes. Bogdan makes a living off the fucking, you know, he money makes, he makes from those comps, this and that. So it's like, I, I don't know. It's, it is that, that group mindset of everyone's like, oh, fuck this guy. Oh, fuck this guy. And, every, and everyone will agree with me and there's no repercussions yeah. of saying that. So, um, yeah, okay. that's right. Yeah. And I think too, one thing that's hard to understand going back in history is how small the community was. Mm. It's so much bigger now. So many more teams, so many yeah. more brands. You have, you have, I think, Matt LaRose in Canada. Yeah. A small yeah. little guy crossed 15 million subscribers on YouTube. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's like it all of a sudden you have this world where it's so much bigger. And back then it was so small. So I think things spread more powerfully back in the early days when people weren't making money. When there, when there were still paradigms against making money, it was a different world. It was a different world. So every small culture starts that way, though, where it's like you're a sellout if you try to make money and this and that. It's still prevalent today, you know. I mean, it's, I think it's, 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 it's stupid. You know, what I mean, it's like people get annoyed at you for trying to sell a film that you spent a year on. Like, fuck's sake, man. <laughs> like, people need to make a living. You know what I mean? Um, was that around the time that this, I don't exactly remember what was said in the video, but I vaguely remember this Kai dishes the dirt video came out where Kai Willis was, was saying some negative things about you. Do, do, do you remember that situation? Yeah. That like burned the house down. You know, that was the, yeah. that was the, the final blow. That one really hurt. That one really hurt. But that well, was, but Kai later. has a lot of negative stuff to his name as well in the community. So I don't know if his, his credibility is, is the, the most valid anyway, but yeah. Well, eight years ago, I think it was. So, yeah. but that yeah. was five years later. That was okay. the domain thing we talked about, or that's not even the domain thing. The website thing we just talked about was kind of step one. And there was four or five other things before the Kai Willis thing came in. Okay, well, what so was it? we can run through those pretty quickly, I think. Yeah. Um, the next thing was the way I chose to market the company. So I think around 2010, I'm not exactly sure the date, but somewhere around 2010, I changed the marketing of take flight to be, you could say our tagline was the official clothing of parkour. Okay. People didn't like it. Yeah. I can see why. Yeah. yeah. I can see why too. Now, the reason I did that was because I flew to France and met with David. And we yeah. basically signed a verbal endorsement contract that he was going to endorse the company. So as soon as I came back from France, I then changed the marketing to the official clothing of parkour. But I didn't tell everyone that we had started working with David. And the reason was because there wasn't like an official contract signed. And then also because he was in France and we were in the States, there was no way to show a relationship. So we had this verbal agreement to move ahead together, but there wasn't money changing hands. There wasn't an mm. official contract. There was none of that, but we had his support. And I think yeah. at that time, we're still the only clothing company in the parkour world. The only, we make clothing for park, parkour people. That's what we do. That's our mission. We were still, I think the only one. So it wasn't even, it, what year like, was it this? Was definitely, it was definitely arrogant, but it, it also, and what year was it? Yeah. I'm going to say it was 2010. Okay. Cool. I think it was yeah. 2010. Um, but I, I that, could yeah. have things mixed up a little bit. I could have things up because I, I might have gone to visit David in two, in October, November 2008. It's possible I went then before I launched the brand. I'd have to look at my email records, my, my flight records and stuff. No, of course, but anyway, yeah. somewhere yeah, in there, very, very early on, very early on, like 2009, 2010, we changed the marketing of the company, the tagline, the official clothing of parkour. It was because I got the blessing of David and people didn't like that. So I remember, I remember we were running advertisements on Google ads and I think easy was visiting the United States and he saw one of the ads and he wrote me some nasty email and said, you're lying and all this stuff. You're not the official clothing, blah, blah, blah. We're the official clothing or something like that. <laughs> I don't know. That's really I was, funny. I, I was definitely willing to step on people's toes. I think one of, now that I'm thinking about it, I think one of our ads said something like the official clothing of worldwide parkour. And I did that because Urban Free Flow was marketing their stuff as, I don't know, the, 
the center of worldwide parkour. He had used worldwide parkour or something. And so I decided to put that in our advertisements and he got really pissed. So <laughs> I didn't mind pissing people off. Uh, I guess I was willing to like, I don't know, step on some toes, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's life, I guess. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. You know, it's just, well, if that's what your mind is fair, like, you know what I mean? Okay, so that happened. You had the email from Easy. That's funny because obviously Easy's like this massively contentious character. And Jimmy, <laughs> went ahead, well, K Kieran, uh, aka Jimmy the Giant, went ahead and made a video about Easy. You know what I mean? Uh, which was didn't paint him in the best light. But there's not that many good things to say about him, really. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I saw that video. Jimmy the Giant's really great, and yeah. I feel bad for Easy. I, I know I never met him, never talked to him besides that one email. And it sounds like he hit his head and really changed. And that's, that sucks, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Anyway. So what was the next big uh, thing? The next thing was domain names. So as I told you, around 2000, 2007, 2008, I started buying domain names. I came across this website and this guy who was an early domain squatter and I read a bunch of stuff from him and realized that dot coms were like internet property and they had a lot of value. So I started buying domain names. And because I started building this parkour company, I wanted to get all the parkour domain names. So I just started buying them. And any, anything I could think of that seemed like a cool name I bought. So First of all, all the clothing things. So I bought parkour t shirts.com, parkour shirts.com, parkour pants.com, parkour sweatshirts.com, parkour backpacks.com, parkour dvds.com. Then I bought things like, um, you know, freerunmagazine.com, freerunningmagazine.com, parkournews.com, parkourcommunity.com, kongvault.com, damndelac.com. Like I just started buying anything that I said, you know what? I could see a business built off of this. Or I could see this being used to promote Take Flight. Or I could see somebody really wanting this in the future. I bought. So I ended up having something like, I want to say 200 or so parkour-related domain names. Wow. Well, we used these to promote Take Flight. So what would happen was on Facebook, for example, we'd launched a new t-shirt on our website. And then I would create a graphic and the graphic would have, you know, our t-shirt in red and our t-shirt in blue. And then underneath it would say parkourshirts.com. And then we'd post it and say, get this shirt at parkourshirts.com. And the idea was to create a very, I mean, there's a lot of ideas behind it, but obviously you're creating a very quick way for people to know how to get your stuff. Yeah. Right? Our so website did all of those out. domain names lead into the same website? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they all did. Okay, they all did. Okay. And then at one point, I created what I called the parkour web. So I actually launched websites on all of these. I launched a website on parkour shirts, a website on parkour pants, a website on parkour sweatshirts. And each one of these websites had an article about parkour and then had links to all the other websites and then a bunch of links to the main page. My idea was to try to get Google to see Take Flight as the hub. Mm -hmm. So you have all these websites that were all backlinking to wow. the. To this. So that was the vision behind it. And then they would lead to certain things. So I think parkournews.com forwarded to our Facebook page. Um, wow. So, so this is why like, Callum from Star calls you a, um, what is it, SEO warlord, a search engine optimization uh, warlord. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe. That'd be very yeah. kind of him uh, to say hey, that. He, but, he did, he did yeah. say that on one of the podcasts, I remember. Yeah. 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 That's funny. Oh. Yeah, well, that was the vision. I'm not, I don't know if it worked or not, but you know, the problem with Take Flight was it never got to scale where I could have a lot of people helping. And so mm -hmm. I had to kind of do the, the worst version of all these ideas. And so they were, it was never, nothing ever really was able to be done really well. And that's not true. Some things were, I think our, some of our designs were done really well. But, you know, like this SEO idea, okay, like lots of domains and a couple cheap websites, but it wasn't done maximum level, you know. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, people got wind of that and they hated it. They hated it. People, I think at this point, people started making, I think there was a Facebook page uh, that was all about 
the nefarious things I'd done. They were speaking bad about me. Someone started a website called takeflightsucks.com. Oh my God. Um, but it, it felt got, too it businessy got, or what? It felt too corporate maybe for them. Yeah, right? I think it felt too corporate. I think you're, I mean, you're a great listener, Max, because you're totally right. And that's the conclusion I drew years later was the mistake I made was I made take, I gave take flight a corporate feel hmm. instead of giving it a personal feel. Okay. Yeah. If I had been yeah, in yeah. videos, if I had been traveling around meeting people, if it had been, Hey, this is Adam and Adam has a brand. Yeah. Then I think people would have seen it different, but it was mm. this entity. It was this corporate vibe entity. Yeah. And faceless entity to some it was a degree. Faceless entity. as totally. opposed to Giles. Yeah. It's like, Giles is like, Hey, I'm quirky Giles with anxiety. Here's my brand, you know, and then people get attached to that. Like, yeah. hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. Okay. hundred percent. But also, some of this was on purpose because there was, I had a bigger vision and this is something that I don't think I've ever explained and people don't understand. When I started take flight, I wrote a 60 page business plan that detailed how I was going to achieve what I wanted to achieve and what I wanted to achieve. Okay. And the vision was you establish the most prominent, biggest, most respected parkour brand. And then you expand out of parkour. That mm. was the vision. How like do we a thrasher. Scale? Yeah. Like a thrasher. Or like every okay. company, like Nike, like Quicksilver. Nike yeah, started yeah. as a running brand. Now they do mm -hmm. everything. So yeah. that was the vision. And so on one hand, I'm courting the poker community. On the other hand, I'm actually courting a different market. Yeah. I want people like Nike to see Take Flight and say, whoa, this is an impressive brand. Maybe we want to buy it. Right? Everyone else in the poker community, even today, people like Store. They're selling t-shirts. Mm. I was trying to sell a brand for millions of dollars. And so I think that, I think people somehow sensed this because it didn't have that authenticity. Mm. And so then mm. they saw it as a money grab and I could see where people might draw that conclusion. So the point is, yeah. is I just had a different vision. I had a bigger vision than the Parker world. Parker was the conduit to make this bigger vision. And Parker was the conduit to scale to other markets to then feed the Parker world. Because- yeah. And my theory was if we sell a million t-shirts to non-parkour people, but then we give all that money to parkour athletes, now we're literally siphoning money from the world, from this world that has trillions of dollars into the parkour world. Like, which how do you which is up? what Thrasher does, you know what I mean? That is what these, you know totally. what I mean? Precisely. Totally. Precisely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We wanted to open like a portal, like this, a wormhole, right? Mm. To the financial assets of the planet and then funnel it into the parkour world. Like you could see if that worked, how it would be, phenomenal and so i yeah. had these probably delusions of it's going to work and then everyone's going to change their opinion of me because once i'm paying millions of dollars in endorsement mm, salaries to mm, poor guys people yeah. say adam adam did it like adam we didn't understand it but he made it work of course yeah, i never yeah. made it work but i had a bigger vision so the domain names was one of the things that started to cause a lot of drama and people were yeah. accusing me of of cyber squatting and accusing me of all sorts of crazy stuff so that was pretty pretty crummy <laughs> so both sides of like the, the the individuals domain names but then also the fact that you just had all these parkour domain names and you were like creating this like net of like parkour stuff driven into into take flight totally okay. totally yeah yeah. Totally, yeah i mean yeah i can see it from both perspectives like it makes sense oh. from a business standpoint um but i i can understand how people are like what the fuck <laughs> you know it's, yeah yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I can see it now too i can see it now too i, I under actually i can see the website thing and the, the individual names, I can see that from both sides. The mm. domain portfolio, I have a tough time seeing because nobody wanted those names. Like, nobody wanted parkourshirts.com. So I'm like, it cost me $10 a year. So I spent, you know, 200 domain names is two grand a year for 10 years. You know, I've spent something like 20 grand to have this domain portfolio. Wow. Who else was going to pay 20 grand for the domain portfolio, right? Nobody else in the parkour world wanted to do that. So I was almost... It was a way for people to say bad things about me, but it didn't make sense why, because no one was trying to buy them. Nobody wanted yeah. them. It wasn't so actually was... hurting them. It was more no. that they, they, they feel like you're accruing all this, this power and this control over the sport, you know, and they don't like that really, you know, and yeah, I think without right. I think proper right. reasoning perhaps, but yeah, you know. Yeah, and without the proper, again, the vibe was different. I think you hit the nail on the head is there wasn't this personal face vibe as a corporate vibe yeah, so yeah yeah i think yeah that might have been a thing especially like imagine you had um david like attached to the brand and you had content with him in it regularly 
um, you know, with his face out the front, that that you know something like that could could change things. Because for a while in parkour, people were still very committed to like this idea of like David and like oh we want to hear everything he has to say. And then five, six, seven years ago, people were like, nah, fuck this guy. We just don't care anymore, you know, because he he never really wanted to be the the figure. He didn't want to be out in front as much as um, people wanted him to. I think, yeah. But he had, he had the opportunity and he kind of let it slip perhaps. Yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting one. Yeah, that. I agree 100%. Well, that is a great segue into David because David was the next controversy. Okay. So um, I had gone out to France and I think, I think, it, was, I think it was 2009. It might have been 2008. might have been 2010. I don't remember. But <clears throat> shook hands with David decided we're going to try to, you know, work together. And then I'm running my parkour gym, Revolution Parkour. And the thought hit me, how am I ever going to really work with David if I'm in the States and he's in France? Mm. And he doesn't speak English and I don't speak French. How is this actually going to work? <laughs> and I thought, you know what? I need to go out and work with him directly. Move to France. And so... I basically proposed that to him. I said, what if I moved out to France and we do a couple things together? Number one, we build take flight together because you endorse the company. Number two, we work on other projects like they had a, a film, a parkour film festival they wanted to do. Oh. And then the other thing is I wanted to work in films. I, and I still to this day have a desire to be in films. And I'm an actor, so I actually do work in films. And so I had this dream of working on films with David as well. So, And I wanted to learn parkour from the man. So I proposed this idea of me moving to France. They accepted the idea and it, it was all ready to go. So I sold my parkour gym and moved to France in March, 2011. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. Wow. To work with what, David. What, what was the parkour gym that you sold? Revolution parkour. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You can look it up. It's still here. After I sold it, the new owner, started two other franchises with former students of mine. Like I had a couple top students and two of them went and started their own franchises. And then since then, and then also I had two or three other students. Who went, like five of my students went and started parkour gyms. Oregon wow. became something like one of the, in the whole world, I think to this day, it might be the biggest, how would you explain it? There's more parkour gyms per capita in Portland, Oregon than I think any other country in the, any other city in the world it might be that and that's because of me because i started revolution parkour that started two franchises i had three other i think uh students that went and started gyms we had like six parkour gyms in this small radius which maybe that exists somewhere else in the world but anyway so yeah revolution parkour had three locations and then one of them rebranded now there's only two but yeah so no that's really interesting yeah okay so you moved to france that's fucking crazy i didn't know that what yeah, I moved to France with David. It got crazy. So I didn't speak any French. I spoke 10 <laughs> words of French. Like, oh, wow. I, I got Rosetta Stone before I moved. And then I said, you know what? I'm not going to study this because I'm going to learn more when I'm actually in France than here on a computer. So I didn't even, I didn't know anything. I knew how to say, um, I'd like a train ticket to Avignon. That's all I knew how to say. Those are the Avignon. only words I knew how to say. And That's yes funny. and no. Because, uh, so anyway, I, I, I flew to Paris. I think it was March 25th or something, March 24th, March 25th, 2011. And in the process of forming a relationship with David, I had hired a translator and the translator had become a friend of mine. So realizing that David didn't speak English and I didn't speak French, I decided that I would spend the first few months in the South of France where my translator lived and learn the language and get involved with the culture. Wow. And so I did that. So the first three months I spent in Avignon, where I learned French. And then things got really wonky. So here's what happened. David's right-hand man, when I moved to France, was a guy named Guy, Guy Genaudet. He had become more or less a fa father figure for David and had handled David's affairs for years at this point. When I, was con when I was communicating with David and when I met with him, all communication went through Guy. Oh, wow. So I would talk to my translator. My translator would write Guy. Guy would talk to David. David would talk to the translator or David, oh, wow. David, David would talk to Guy. 
Guy would talk to Amari, my translator. Amari would talk to me. So it was this chain of communication because number one, David and I didn't speak the same language. And number two, David doesn't want to be on a computer. He just doesn't care. So this was the communication and Guy was the right hand guy. And I was coming there to support them. And I don't know, like, I didn't really know what was going to happen exactly. I just was going to work with him, learn parkour from him, maybe work on films with him, build, take flight. I didn't know. Sold the gym, hired a manager. The one guy that I trained in parkour with, a guy named Brian Morrison, I hired him to manage the take flight operations while I was in France. And then I managed up, I managed things like design and production and such. Anyway, long story short, I moved to France. Two months after I get there, Guy passes away. He had stomach cancer. Yeah, it was crazy. I didn't even know he was sick. And all of a sudden I heard that he uh, passed away. Wow. So Fuck. that was pretty wild because he was my link to David. And so I didn't know. I didn't even know if I was going to be able to still work with David because it wasn't like David and I were aligned in together. I, I can't even speak his language. And so That's when Guy passed, it was, like, it was like the link cut. And I'm like, holy crap. Holy so shit. I decided I was going to go to the funeral, to Guy's funeral. And so I took a, I think I took a train to Paris or something like that. Went to the funeral. Ended up meeting a couple of parkour guys, uh, Jonathan and Alex, who are Lisois, born and raised in Lise. And then went back to, uh, to Avignon. Anyway, long story short, three months after I got there, I decided it was time to move to Paris and try to, I don't know, like do what I came here to do. But I think at this point, David had deleted his Facebook. He's a bit bipolar in his social media presence, yeah. in case anyone's ever figured that out. So I don't even, I don't even know how to contact him, but I'm just trusting. I'm going to go to Paris. I'm going to go to Lise. Maybe I will meet him, figure it out. I don't even know at this point what's going to happen. So I go oh. to, I moved, I moved to Every. I found an apartment in Every, and. I think the first week I'm there, I'm in lease and I'm walking around lease and I run into Alex and Jonathan who I'd met at Guy's funeral. Uh -huh. They're like, Hey, and I, I don't think I even remembered their names. I was like, Hey, uh, you know, and I, at this point I kind of, at this point after three months, I speak some French, but I'm not great at it. I'm pretty good. I'm actually pretty good, but not great. So we fumble through a conversation and long story short, they connect me with David. So I think we then had a meeting at David's house a week later or something. And all of a sudden I'm there somehow in David's apartment or something. I don't remember exactly what happened, but uh, anyway. And then from there, David and I just like matched and we just became good friends. So then it, it just, everything flowed from there. And because Guy was gone, I became David's guy. I became the guy that he you know, could talk to, hmm. could could share his ideas with, could could work with. I became his right hand guy, and so it kind of worked out in this miraculous, serendipitous way. And additionally, not only was I there to, you know, vet inquiries from other people and things like that that Guy was doing, but I had the business mind. So I'm thinking, David, like now we can really go gung ho and you know build, take flight, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So. It took a few months of communication. That's not true. I moved there in July. And by August, I had convinced David that he needed to have a social media presence. Mm -hmm. So long story short, we launched a YouTube, a Twitter, a Facebook, and a website all on the same day. Holy shit. All of those linked to each other. And they all link to take flight. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm in France working with David, we can have the official link, the official relationship. We can now use him to promote take flight. Now, additionally, and this is another thing, I owned the domain name davidbell.com. So back in my domain acquisition phase, I ran into, I realized David, I, oh, okay, blah, blah, blah. Accroche toi. My favorite video from David Beller, or one of my favorites. Have you seen mm -hmm. it? It's a black and white video in Lease. Maybe. Oh, it would have been a while ago. Oh, people probably have, and it's so good. This mm. was one of my favorite videos when I was getting into parkour. At the bottom of the video, for the entire video, it says davidbell.com. 
Okay. Go look up, if you type in a crochetois in YouTube, you'll find the video. It says davidbell.com. They made this video in something like 2004 or something like that. I don't know when they made it. Early 2000s. So in 2008, 2007, 2008, I'm doing my parkour thing. I realized the power of domains and I type in davidbell.com and it goes to just some random domain site that says the domain's for sale. And yeah. so remember my idea of like, I'll buy Tim Sheaf and Mark Turok and danedwards.com. I did it with David. So I, I did this in 2008. I bought davidbell.com. It cost me $1,500, but I bought davidbell.com. Gee, that's expensive. Yeah, no, I mean, I put a lot, I put a lot of money into things. Yeah. Fuck when you, hell. when you register a domain brand new, it's like 10 bucks. You know, if you want to go get maxward.com, if no one's ever registered it, it'll yeah. be 10 bucks. But if someone's bought bucks. it and they want to sell it, which they do with any common name, I, I presume, as an investment. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. It took me like two years uh, to get adamdunlap.com. That's a whole other story. But talking anyway, so I had this domain. So I was like, sweet. So we launched David Bell's website on davidbell.com. We launched his social media. It all pointed to itself and it all pointed to take flight. People then assumed somehow, I don't know how, they assumed that I was impersonating David Bell to market take flight. So as soon as those websites launched, there became, as far Whoa. as I can tell, the biggest, the biggest rumor mill thing in the Parker world was Adams impersonating David Bell. So I guess this, this bad will, whatever you call it, that had built up over time, mm -hmm. all of a sudden then assumed, you know, these people that had a negative paradigm of me, then assumed that this David Bell presence was Adam. And, I think the, the empathetic viewpoint would be to say, no one knew I was working with David. The only people I told about me moving to France were my students. So my students knew we had a goodbye party. Nobody else knew for a lot of reasons. Number one, I, I'm a private guy. I've never been someone to like talk about all my accomplishments, which also speaks to why Take Flight had this corporate vibe to it. I didn't want it to be about me. I wanted it to be about the brand and I wanted it to be about the athletes. Like mm -hmm. every other brand posts about themselves, the people behind it. I didn't, I didn't want to be the face of Take Flight. I wanted the athletes to be the face of Take Flight. And so in that same mentality, I'm moving to France to work with David. At that time in 2011, just about every tracer would give like their left arm like to meet David. You know, he's this almost godlike figure to a lot of people. I'm going to work with him. What I want to talk about it online, like, that would just feel wrong. It'd be like I'm gloating or bragging or something. That, I'm not. I'm not in it for the the fame, right? I'm in it to learn parkour from the founder of parkour. I'm in sure. it to build something awesome. I'm building. I'm in it to, to, for these other reasons that are all good reasons. So anyway, all of a sudden, all this stuff launches, and people go crazy. The parkour world, from my perspective, went crazy, and it mm -hmm. was Adams impersonating David Bell. It was crazy. It was wild. And you had you had the biggest leaders in the parkour world talking about this. And Tim Sheaf at the time was was a top 10 guy for sure. And yeah, he he's laughing. saying he's saying Adam's a snake, blah, blah, blah. He's impersonating David Bell. R ridiculous, ridiculous things. So I feel like that really cemented the negativity. Um, the negativity got pretty bad. I finally talked to David and I said, David, they're saying all these bad things about me. What should we do? And he said, let's take a photo together. I'll post it on my page and I'll say we're working together. And that'll you know, put a kibosh on all this yeah. stuff. Nip so we went in his backyard. We took a photo together. And he posted that on his Facebook page and said, this is my friend Adam. We're working together. I trust him completely. He has a heart for parkour. And that put a kibosh on the – it didn't put a kibosh on the rumor. I'll tell you. It made people like Tim Sheaf realize they were wrong, but it didn't solve any problems. I took screenshots of some of these Facebook communication threads because I wanted to remember who the people were that were saying these things about me. I wanted to have a blacklist of sorts and say, these are the type of people that I don't want to work with. And I remember one guy said something like, Adam's awful. He cares about money. He's impersonating David Bell. He's an awful person. Don't support his company. And then later in that thread, somebody said, hey, a photo just came out. It looks like it's true. Adam's, uh, you know, not impersonating Bell. <laughs> and the person who had said all these things then responded and said, well, what did he say? 
Adam's still shady as fuck. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, you probably didn't know who I was before this rumor came out. Yeah. The rumor happened. You then think I'm an awful person. The rumor's debunked, and you still think I'm an awful person. Like, how does that make any sense? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's so hard I'm to like, change people's mind, really. I can't win. Years later, years later, because I, I worked with David for a few years after that, years later, like in 2014, you would still sometimes see a post on David Bell's social media. Like on his, because back then you, there used to be like um, a different page of like follower comments. Sure. Now, you know, it's yeah. changed so much over the years, but there used to be like all these pages. You could have multiple pages on your profile or whatever. And you'd get people who would write on David Bell's social media three years later or four years later or five years later. Guys, don't trust this page. It's Adam impersonating David Bell. <laughs> years after this, literally, this isn't yeah. a joke. So somehow this propagated in a way that wasn't debunked like was never fully debunked. And the people who came out and were saying awful things about me never apologized. They doubled down. Well, he's not impersonating David Bell, but he's still a snake. I'm like, uh, yeah, wrong. it's rough. And I'm, I'm like, God, I haven't, I haven't done anything wrong. I did nothing wrong, right? I went, to, I went to France to work with the founder. Like maybe you're jealous. I don't know, but I've done nothing wrong. I'm working with David Bell. I'm helping him grow his presence online. I'm helping him get sponsors. We're building him take flight through his through his endorsement. I've done. I literally have done nothing wrong. I I, I, I gave away my parkour gym. I pretty much gave it away, Max. Hmm. Right. So it's like I don't know anybody else who built a parkour gym. It was one of the first parkour gyms in the country. Then says I'm going to give the gym away to then go work with David Bell because that's my heart for parkour. Like it's like not only did I not do anything wrong, what I did was was a noble pursuit of the discipline in its truest form. I'm going to go learn parkour from the founder. It's like great, all you great parkour guys, Jason Paul, Tim Sheaf, Kai Willis. I don't care who you guys are. You're really good. Awesome. You studied videos and you trained in a gym, but you never trained with David. Right. Mm -hmm. So like bravo to you, but who cares more about the sport? Someone who goes to the, the origin or someone who's like, yeah, I'm, I can do like great drops. You know, in, you're, it's the seventies, right? Who cares more about martial arts? The guy who watches videos and emulates it or the guy who goes to Bruce Lee and says, will you teach me? Can I be your student? Like there's, there's a total difference there. And so not mm -hmm. only did I not do anything wrong, but I made steps to make sure that the, spirit and true discipline of parkour would propagate throughout history because I understand the discipline now in a way that not many people do because not many people have trained with David and spent countless hours understanding and learning and talking about the discipline with him. Right. Sure. Like if you want to do lineage, I think I'm qualified to say I learned parkour from David. How many people can say I learned parkour from David? No one on mm -hmm. store can Giles can't Tim Sheaf can't Jason Paul can't. Mm. I think the counter argument is that the style of parkour that David began with and trained is not what the sport is today. Um, so I don't think people would put as much value in that as they did back in the day. When I started, like I trained with guys uh, like one degree of separation who trained from David, you know what I mean? So it was like huge. Yeah. But now sure. people like people starting will be like, well, I just don't care, you know. Parkour is a different sport. And I wish there was another name for it because when I when I say parkour, to me it's parkour by David Bell. Yeah, that's yeah. what parkour is. Now you know I've heard you say in this conversation the founders. Like, I'm very adamant there's one founder. Sure. But there's a lot of people in England who think oh there was nine founders at the Yamakaze etc etc. And I can debunk all those. Um. But you know happy to agree to disagree because I'm not I don't like conflict. But the point being is it, the word parkour is now used to mean this urban movement style, right? I mean, you can do a, a Kong to a round off back full and it's parkour, right? Mm. I mean, yeah, me, the that's... parkour free running debate kind of ended and now it's all just kind of the same, essentially, in, in, the, in the eyes of the people. Is, you know 100%. I mean? yeah. And I think that's probably a good thing. I, I think it's probably yeah, a good I agree. thing. I agree. Yeah. It's like, who cares, man? It's like, at the end of the day, it's all words, right? At yeah, the end of the day, yeah. it's movement and such. But I care very much about the history and about the original spirit because I don't think we're here today 
if David doesn't exist. If David doesn't do mm. what he does, it doesn't exist. Like he pioneered movements that are now ubiquitous. We see them everywhere. We see them in movies. We see them. Um, we see them all over the world. And these movements, like literally, you could say, didn't exist before David brought them into existence through his passion and his effort. And then yeah. since then, people have built on them and expanded on them, right? I don't know if I've ever seen David really do a double Kong, right? We, now you have like these massive double Kongs, right? Mm. David probably would have just Kong to pre type thing, right? Mm. So people have evolved the movement, which is awesome. It's awesome. And it's the way every sport is from surfing to snowboarding to skateboarding. But to me, that's all free running. You know, for me, parkour is the original discipline, the warrior spirit, the training method. It is that word discipline as well, really, because it was very much about like training, you know, like a like a warrior and like really doing the conditioning and doing all the work around it. And the, the output almost wasn't as important. Whereas now the best guys in the world just smoke weed and fucking jump and they're sick and they do amazing shit. But it's so and, and people care because it's what's the most visually impressive. And that's all people will ever care about is the top level movement right but it's so far removed from the you know the mentality and the philosophy that you're so sort of still attached to which is how sure. it began you know what i mean 100 percent. Yeah, yeah i mean very astute observation that's totally it because i began and... with that as well and i've transitioned to three two one fucking send it essentially but i really? understand both yeah yeah fully but i understand both sides of the argument it took me like years before i even did flips you know what i mean but then, like, mm -hmm. I, I still, I train like an athlete, actually, but I like mm -hmm. the send it mentality. Like, I do, I do um, athletics twice a week. I do long jump, I lift, you know, I do all this other shit um, to mm -hmm. support the parkour. But I still, I still like just, because for me, it's about um, the core tenet of parkour is, is risk management. It's about the mental more than, more than anything. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's beside the point. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna get kicked out in less than a minute, which means in less than a minute I can start a new one, so we don't have to wait five minutes this time. So I might just that's do that. Um, yeah, All sweet. Right. And yeah, just what I was messaging you about. Obviously, the this interview is like the main core thing, which which should be so useful. But then yeah, I want to hear from like a couple of people who feel like a certain type of way and get get their ideas, yeah. and then you can you can speak to it in what you've said so far, um, so you get that. So it doesn't feel like super yeah. one-sided. So if you give me a couple of names, whatever, it'd be, be interesting to get into. Yeah. Because I think you've been really candid about any, everything. So anything they say, I can equally pair with the response that you've given in this and get a get yeah. an impartial back and forth going, essentially, would be, would be ideal. Sweet. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, that's what... I'm more curious about other people's view than mine because... Like I said, yeah, I can explain absolutely. the steps, but I don't quite understand it. Uh, no, let's absolutely. see. It'd be interesting. So yeah, let's get into it. Um, so what is it? Yeah, the, the Kai dishes the dirt. That's already yeah. <laughs> it's a crazy well, title. Look, you know what I realized? I, these breaks have given me a chance to write out the things. And I realized okay, we're cool. on controversy five of nine. So oh my we'll God, rifle okay. through them. We'll rifle through them because I think we've no laid worries. a good foundation. But, cool. but to recap, the way I see it, Making money was the first thing, starting a company. Then the next controversy was the domain names and websites of individuals. Okay. The third thing seemed to me to be the marketing. So calling it the official clothing of parkour turned a lot of people off. Okay. The fourth thing was the dom domain portfolio, the parkour domain portfolio of all the parkour domain names. The fifth thing was this rumor that I was impersonating David Bell. So... Those are kind of the first five. There's four more. Now, to be also to, to worth saying, I'm not so, sure if the domain. Wait, what are, what are the next four as well? Because it's nice having you list them out like this. Yeah. All right. The next four is then you have a, another marketing thing. Then you have a, a copywriting parkour thing. Then you have Kai Willis Dishes the Dirt. And then you have this personal website, which I don't even want to talk about, but we could talk about that too. So we'll, we'll finish off. We'll finish off with that one. Why not? Okay. All so, right. Why not? It's that's nice. It's in. nice that you've got nine, nine things like laid out to speak to all of them. That's yeah. It's, it's, it's structured. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of structured and I, the order could be slightly off. For example, the domain portfolio might not have come to prominence until after I started working with David, but whatever. It's all right. I don't claim to be like 
super accurate about any, everything. I mean, if you watch Kieran's videos as well, he gets a lot of historical stuff wrong. And I'm not trying to claim that I get everything right either. So it's, it, don't worry, man. Yeah. All right. So the impersonating David Bell thing came and went. It's still there. Number six was another marketing faux pas. So when I was living in France, 2011, 2012, I realized the future of parkour and the future of take flight isn't in clothing. It's in shoes. And sure. I realized that especially, it was probably a pride issue, especially the fact, especially because we're marketing ourselves as the official clothing of parkour, we have to maintain that lead, so to speak. So we have to pivot into parkour shoes. So okay. I think it was in 2012, I decided we're going to make parkour shoes. And so we began designing shoes. Our very first prototype was a shoe that David Bell envisioned, which I still have a copy of. I might make a take flight story around the, the first shoe because the first prototype was a David Bell designed shoe. Anyway, long story short, in 2014, we launched the Take Flight 1.0, which we still have a couple pairs of, by the way. So it's cool historical context. But anyway, long story short, I decided to market the company with the slogan, the greatest parkour shoe of all time. So true to true to Adam's form of bombastic marketing, <laughs> I just took it up a notch. I took it up a notch. But, yeah. but again, it wasn't like the craziest thing to say because at this point in time, there's only been a few parkour shoes ever made. The yeah. WFPF had a shoe and they just copied uh, like a Kalenji. I think maybe Three Run had launched the shoe at this point, Chase Armitage and Three Run. And Olo had launched the shoe. And I thought ours was the best and ours was designed to be the best. You know, I designed it with the vision that in 20 years, people will still wear the shoe because it's so well made. And it's so based on a first principle approach to parkour training that this shoe will more or less never die that was kind mm. of the vision so i mean that's marketing though you got to say outlandish shit, particularly okay. like american marketing you got to just be like fuck it we're the best <laughs> you know we're totally yeah it's yeah. i'm glad you understand that it's the american way you know it we're, is it's man. Like you, you say it and maybe you fake it till you make it it's like nobody cares about this is a great parkour shoe you should wear it nobody yeah. cares the greatest parkour shoe of all time. People want that on it's their the feet. It's the fucking best, yeah. you know. And it's the same yeah. with YouTube titles. You gotta say some crazy shit. Like, is what yeah. you know? What I mean, that's the game, man. Yeah. I that's the way I saw it, but other people didn't. And then mm -hmm. this just came to mind. There was another marketing faux pas. We launched a pair of parkour pants, and we called them the WB parkour pants, and WB stood for world's best. <laughs> and we got some flack for that too. And Tim Sheaf especially didn't mm. like that for some reason. So yes, I'm always I'm about big claims and uh, but but not but not empty claims. You know, maybe maybe it's no different. Maybe it's semantics. But I did believe the shoe was the best parkour shoe ever made, and mm -hmm. I wore it and I loved it, and it was the best parkour shoe I'd ever worn. And so. It wasn't like, oh, it's a crap shoe. Let's think of a cool marketing way to oh, make people want it. To me, it was, we believe we believe what we say. And I've never said anything I didn't believe in. Yeah. So, um, of course, in retrospect, they weren't the greatest parkour shoes of all time. But uh, I believed it when we launched it. So you know, I, I, I've always stood behind what I say. And that's why, that's why I'm willing to be so candid because I don't, I don't, I'm not a liar. I don't, everything I say, I believe. I've made some mistakes in life. We all do. But mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. not, um, I'm not an inauthentic person. And so I'm willing to, to take responsibility for my actions because it's who I am. So, yeah. yeah so I then mean, that that's was a good thing. If you can come out and be just candid, like, yeah, I understand why people didn't like that. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you can just be like, well, yeah, I fucked up. You know what I mean? And then that's like, it's, it's the people that die on the hill of being too proud. And like, right. they're the people that really get under everyone's skin but everyone makes mistakes you know what i mean so yeah it's just good to it's cool to to hear the full story it's fucking super interesting like <laughs> to me yeah yeah and i think also at that point when we launched the shoe in 2014 i really stopped caring what the parkour community mm -hmm. wanted because there was two things happening number one i couldn't win 
you had these people, they were making hate websites, takefightsucks.com. Scott Bass, who I deplore, I think he's an awful human being. I'm happy to be on working for that. He's an, I don't know why Daniel Abaca works with him. Like that guy, yeah. uh, he led the charge and was very vicious in, in his public attacks of Take Flight. Jeez, yeah. And so I couldn't win. And then you also started to see this case where the negativity was so pernicious in the pork world that it was affecting our ability to grow. So people wouldn't wear our clothing because their friends, they'd go to a jam and people would look mm. look at them weird. So Joey yeah. Adrian, who I adore, I you know, in contrast to Scott Bass, who's a horrible human being, like that should be on repeat. Someone should remix that so everyone knows. <laughs> I hate that guy. Uh, I'll put that you in know. the video, don't worry. <laughs> please do, please do. If that guy wants to come to my house, we can battle it out, you know, with fists because I don't like that guy at all, you know. <laughs> Um, yeah. In contrast, I mean, you'd, to him, you'd, Joey, you'd probably win. I bet the bloke. He's yeah, he's yeah, not the most know. athletic. I don't, <laughs> I don't know anything about him. I don't know anything about him. I think he's a phenomenal filmmaker. Like he's just the best. Um, but you know, sometimes sheep's and sheep and wolf's clothing, whatever it's called, a wolf in sheep's clothing. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Contrast, no, enough of him. Enough of him. You know, enough of that. He was yeah. one of he was one of the big proponents of, of of sharing awful things. And no matter how much you engaged with him, no matter how much you tried to say, look, no matter how much you took responsibility, explained yourself, tried to to get on his good graces, he would just double down more and more. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot about human behavior and human psychology through this experience. You can't if someone hates you, you can't fix it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, there was a lot of that. In contrast, Joey Adrian. Is a beautiful Legend. human being. Yeah, I know the guy. Love Joey. Love man. I would. I'd probably die for Joey if if I had to. Like a great human yeah. being. I mean that. And he would tell me he was always loyal to Take Flight, and he still wears Take Flight to this day. And he would tell me. He said I would go to jams, and people would ask me why are you wearing Take Flight? Like Adam, blah blah blah. They'd say bad things about me. Mm -hmm. And Joey said, Well, I would explain. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but the way I remember him saying things was more or less, Adam, I, I told him my experience with you has always been great. I like your products. You've always been good to me. And that's that. And then they would stop. It was like, okay, and then we'd move on from the issue. Yeah, the yeah. point was is what Joey made me realize, what he gave me insight to, was that you go to these big jams and meetups, and there was a negativity around Take Flight and me. And, and there was nothing I could do to get through to that. And at this point, too, in 2014, we have endorsement salaries. So I just made a, a Take Flight story, if you go to the Take Flight YouTube, where we talk about, and I think it's on the Instagram as well, we pioneered endorsement salaries for tracers. So in 2012, I think, maybe 2011, somewhere in there, we started paying athletes. And by 2014, we had something like $17,000 of endorsement salaries. Oh, Adding shit. David Bell and clothing and product, we had around $30,000 in endorsement uh compensation for our pros and so it's, and i'm not making any money i'm not making any money like my life is supported through other things that i'm doing and so i'm running this company kind of like a nonprofit. i'm giving all the money to pros we're making great products we're working with david bell and yet i can't break through the community won't accept me they won't wear my gear like the core parkour community will not touch my my brand and mm -hmm. i think we're the brand doing the most in the parkour world at the time to push forward that business opportunity and to mm. support tracers in what they're doing. And it's giving back in a selfless way. Now other brands are doing great things, but from a financial standpoint, I don't know anybody else who was doing the amount of sales we were doing, whose owner was getting less than I was getting because I was getting nothing and whose financial compensation and endorsement salaries was more than us. So on all yeah. those three, I've never heard was, any, any numbers like that for um, endorsing athletes. Usually no. it's just like clothes. You know what I mean? Uh, no, no, uh, no, and so. Wow. So what was the next of the big you know, um, of the yeah, big controversies? Yeah, so marketing was a thing. Then the next big one was copywriting parkour. Okay. So what happened was, and we didn't copyright parkour, but that was what somehow stuck. So I'm working with David. We launched the David Bell brand of clothing. I'm thinking long term, and I say, you know. What we could probably do is establish a trademark for parkour so we could make parkour an official brand name mm. for clothing now here's the thing 
Pilates, yogas, these things are brand names that the founders of those modalities established. Mm -hmm. You can't be a Pilates teacher, Max, without taking courses from, I don't know how it works exactly, but from the Pilates foundation lineage, That's right? Interesting. David yeah. didn't do that with parkour. If David, if David had had a business mind or if he had trusted business minds, Somewhere in the early 2000s, he would have made parkour a trademark. It'd be international, and you could only teach parkour if you were certified and went through courses with David. He never did that. He said, this is parkour. He unleashed it on the world. Part of that is his laziness. Part of that is his lack of business acumen. Part mm -hmm. of that is because I think it's his heart that he wasn't trying to own something in that way. And so... At this point, when we we're working together in 2011, 2012, he didn't own anything. And he was pretty bitter in some ways that people were making money from parkour and he wasn't. You know, mm. MTV has the ultimate parkour challenge in which they also used his David Bell logo in the intro to that. So David Bell's not making any money. He's really poor. I'm an American who come and I have a business. I'm building up his spirit. I think when I met him, he was really depressed. I pulled him out of that depression. Mm. I'm paying for his livelihood, buying groceries for his mom, buying him a computer, cell phones, et cetera, et cetera. And I say, David, I think we can make Take Flight a trademark, an official brand. And what that would mean is that nobody can use parkour on clothing except for us. If mm. we establish and own this trademark with the USPTO, United States Patent and Trademark Office. And he likes the idea. So we file for a trademark with parkour. And my vision was <clears throat> that we would control the parkour name and then anybody in the parkour world who wanted to use parkour on t-shirts or clothing could then pay us a small fee and all the fees that we got from people basically licensing the name would go to defend our trademark because it can get very expensive to defend trademarks as I've experienced in the take flight journey. So we have filed for trademarks with the USPTO. You can find them on the USPTO.gov website. It was a co-filing, Adam Dunlap and David Bell. And we moved down that path to own the word parkour. This was somehow misconstrued and people thought we had copywritten parkour, which doesn't even make sense. Copyrights are for things like music or books or something like that. Trademarks have to do with brands in specific classifications. So we filed for the parkour brand in clothing, which usually extends to shoes as well. We wanted okay, to be the so only- So you weren't copywriting parkour, you were trademarking it for clothing and for shoes, or you were attempting to. Yes, yeah, yes. Okay. Yep. That, was the, okay. that was the idea. And this started a bit of a firestorm as well in the parkour world, that we had right. copywritten parkour, copywritten parkour, copywritten parkour. The most prominent example that I can think of that shows how much this idea permeated the parkour world is I believe it was brought up at the Tempest Takeover. So Tempest had this huge event. Mm. In my opinion, it's still one of the coolest events ever in yeah, parkour. Yeah, yeah. I want to say it was 20... They did two. 2013. They did, they did two. Yeah, they did two. The first one was just the most epic one ever. Yeah, they brought in everybody. Yeah. They brought. In. And as I a kid, a, I was like, "What the fuck?" Oh was my so gosh! And the videos, and I went yeah, down to yeah. it and had a great conversation with Ryan Doyle and then Toby Seeger, who was working. Actually, I had a friend from fucking Sydney, Australia, who flew out. He wasn't a pro. He just flew out to to see. No it. way. Yeah, yeah. Back in the day, Clyde Bourne, Mad Light, fucking legend. Yeah, that was funny. Just remembering that. Tempest now. is legend, man. Tempest is mm. legend. Yeah. Paul Darnell is a legend. I don't think he gets the credit he deserves. That's another story. So anyway, uh, apparently there was some evening before I got there. All the pros are there in a room. And someone brings up this idea of Adam copywriting parkour. Oh. Like all the pros. We're talking like the biggest leaders in the parkour world are talking about it. Like uh. what do we do about this? What are their opinions? Fuck. And I think somebody, I don't know who it was. I feel like it was Sean Wood or something. <laughs> a lot of respect for Sean. What a legend. Man, like Sean, yeah. Love that guy. Love that guy. As somebody, though, it might not have been him, said something like, yeah, he didn't copyright it. He just trademarked it for parkour. And then what I heard was everyone was more or less like, oh, okay, whatever. And they just moved on. <laughs> like, you know, like, <laughs> like, as soon as people realized what was happening, they didn't really care. And additionally, you can... 
it's expired, right? We, I let the trademark expire for various reasons. It's now public domain. Anyone can use parkour on clothing. But if you go look at the trademark, David Bell's name is on it. He was an owner of the trademark. So I'm thinking, guys, how can you be mad at David Bell trademarking parkour, the word he invented for his discipline? Mm. It doesn't. So anyway, it was it was another one of those drama things that I could kind of understand but also i don't understand so that but was in terms of david's involvement with take flight at this point like does he own part of the business or how does it work from like a business perspective i wish i wish he refused to sign he refused to sign a contract oh okay i yes, pressed so. and pressed and pressed for an endorsement contract and the endorsement contract would have things like how much we were paying him and stuff mm -hmm. so because he refused to sign it was simply a handshake agreement yeah. And I paid him okay. a very large amount of money every month just to be able to use his name. And of course, the hope was is that we would have him more involved in taking photos and videos. But mm -hmm. he, he, didn't, he didn't want to do that stuff. And then also, I was so busy and didn't, I'm not a production guy. Like, I can do it, but I, I don't know how to edit videos the way you do. I don't know how to shoot mm. stuff. And so, I didn't, at the time, I didn't have a smartphone. So it, it was very difficult to, you know, like, you got to pull out like a mm. DSLR and, and I didn't have the editing programs. So I have virtually no footage with David. I have, there's two photos in existence of me with David and one's just oh, wow. I'm in the background. Like I spent years with this man. He was my best friend. I was in his inner circle and yet I have almost no evidence of it. It's really strange. Wow. So wow. in 2012, I went back to France because quick, quick side story, but it's really cool. Okay. David was going to be a, the stunt coordinator for the film The Family with Robert De Niro. Wow. He calls me up on the phone and says, Adam, you got to come to France. I'm working with Luc Besson. I will get you a role in this film. You have to come to France. At this point, I'd moved back to the States. So I, I was there for about 10 months, worked with David, blah, 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 blah. So I said, David, I, I got to take flight stuff to do. It's expensive. He's like, dude, you got to come out to France. I promise you I'll get you a job in France. Mm -hmm. So I go back to France. Long story short, he can't give me a job on the film. But Fuck. for those three months, I live in his mom's house, sleeping on a mattress uh, upstairs in David Bell's, in David David's old room, the room he grew up in. So like mm. I'm I, I I go with his mother to the grocery store. I buy his mom's groceries, right? Like it's like I was like I was part of his family. In 2011, Christmas dinner was David, his mother, and me we had Christmas dinner together. I'm a part of his inner circle, like one of his closest friends. I'm supporting him financially, emotionally, just being there to be like, David, you know, you got this, you got this, you, you know, you, life is yours, man. Like wow. it's your oyster, let's make something of it. But I have almost no evidence of it. So it's like, which I, <laughs> yeah. wait, but I don't care, right? It's like, I yeah. thought I was gonna work, for, I, th I thought David and I were aligned. We're gonna work together for 20 years. It's like, maybe you're hanging out with your brother. It's like, are you thinking about taking photos with your brother? Hmm. Usually not. I mean, girls do it, but I don't take photos with my brother because he's my brother. I like, mean, kids today I... probably would, but it's a different generation. Oh, different um, generation. Yeah. And everyone has smartphones. And we didn't yeah, have smartphones yeah. in 2011, exactly. 2012. It's, it's or some people did. So it's like, it wasn't, yeah. in, you know, you have to get a camera and take a photo and it's, it's different. So, anyway. so when did the relationship with David end then? Or did it end in terms yeah, of like... It, it okay. end. It was really weird. It was really weird how it ended. Okay. Uh, it ended in, I want to say it was 2014. Could have been 2015, but I, th I think it was 2014 because I think we'd spent three years working together. Okay. And, uh, and ultimately, it was a money issue. He wanted money, and Take Flight wasn't making any money. And he basically said, pay me or I'm going to stop working with you. Hmm. And I said, David, I, mean, I love you. You're my brother. I don't have any money to pay you. And he said, fine, we're done. And yeah. uh, there's some more details to it. You know, they're very personal details. I, I've, yeah, never no told the, the, I've never told the story publicly, and I'd rather not today. But uh, it was heartbreaking. And David mm -hmm. was really, really bitter towards me and angry towards me. And he's never opened communication again. And uh, I, I love that man. He's a, he's a brother to me, and I'm here for him if he needs anything. But he, uh, he burns his bridges, you know. Like there's a reason why David never established himself in ways that people yeah. hoped he would establish himself. It's because yeah. of him. He's his own worst enemy. Yeah. And he well, I, I know that firsthand because my mom worked with him. Actually, your mom uh, worked with him? Yeah. No. Because 
yeah, yeah. Because because we had like because I knew the founders, like uh, so not the founders. I, I knew the people that he trained, like um, Florian Buzzi and stuff. And then my mum used to be the CEO of Greenpeace, has all this NGO experience, speaks French and English. Um, and so she was there to help him with like some stuff with Paco, um, what they want, Paco Antines Sinel. They were starting, trying to start an NGO. But then she also went up to do the, to help translate and help him with some media stuff around the film. You know, he did, he did the film with Paul Walker and he was, he was in a really bad place and he was really bitter because he got paid shitloads less than Paul Walker and stuff. And she sort of brought him out to meet the parkour guys. But I did get a sense of like from her of his, yeah, how difficult he is to work with. Essentially, he's quite, quite a difficult person, very much into his own thing. And somewhere there's a photo of him in like my old bedroom in France where I used to live with my mom, which is funny. Yeah. No way. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. But no, I, I, I can, um, I can speak to what you're saying about his, his personality. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Yeah. I have some inside stories about brick mansions and stuff, but that's for another time. So yeah, yeah. Man. It, it ended, uh, you know, I would have done anything for him, but, and I think, I think if he had stayed involved with us, I think we'd be in a different place in the world because I think we had so much momentum with parkour.com at the time. We were, we had 150,000 followers on Facebook. Everything we posted was going viral. This is in 20, I think 14 where mm -hmm. social media is still new. You know, Insta, we probably would have started an Instagram soon after that. I mean, there's just no telling what we could have done with David Bell, Parker.com, and a product line, right? And a streamlined production process that I developed for Take Flight. Mm -hmm. It's like, I, I just think, I think we'd be selling half a million or a million dollars of, of apparel and shoes every year now. But uh, he burned yeah. the bridge down. So. Yeah, if there was the media, if he was the figurehead, like, yeah. True, it's, it's possible. It's possible. Fuck it up. It's possible. Who knows? It's possible. So anyway, yeah. So that the what, take flight uh, the copyright parkour was the big issue there. So. Okay. So what was the the next big one? Was that was that Kai? It was Kai. Yep. Kai <laughs> Willis dishes the dirt, which right. he's taken offline. But I have a copy of it because I wanted to have a copy of it. Can you get, can you get me the copy? I probably can. Yeah, I need to sort through some files, but I'll get you. That would be fucking so. great because yeah, I um. I don't remember it very well, <laughs> and I'd love to, you know, put in some inserts. Yeah. Okay, cool. For those who don't know, Kai started this series called Kai Dishes the Dirt. I think yeah. that was the series name. Yeah. And I think the first episode was about me and Take Flight. And he made a bunch of claims in them. I don't really quite remember most of the claims, but one of them was that we were copying designs. So what we had done is we had launched the Take Flight pom-pom hat. Um, it's like a beanie, but it's made of wool and it has like a ball on top. They're very common. Lots of okay. people make them. And they had launched one for Storm mm -hmm. and Storm Free Run because they had their own product line back then, t-shirts and stuff. And then Take Flight launched one. And it resembled the same layout. Like it was, the, it was the same design. And so I guess he concluded that we were copying designs and he had some other gripes, which I don't remember off the top of my head. Of course, we weren't copying designs. It just happened to be a coincidence. You know, the pom-pom hat, which I could give you a, a photo of, is a super generic design. Like mm -hmm. every NFL team has the same exact design. There's probably thousands and thousands of companies, literally probably thousands, that have this exact same design. So anyway, people who had a negative bent found reasons to, to doubt sure. me what I was doing. And so he made this video. It's a pretty rude video. But what's interesting is I actually thought the video was funny. Like, I don't know. I just, it, I just didn't take it seriously. It didn't feel like it had a lot of negative bent behind it. It felt like he was kind of venting. Yeah. I don't know. It didn't, it didn't actually didn't bother me. I laughed originally. I think I probably commented on the YouTube video in the comments and said something about it that was like, Great video, Kai. This is hilarious. Something like that. Don't quote me on that. But sure. I don't remember having any really negative feeling towards it. And I was also in the mindset of any publicity is good publicity, which isn't true. But I was definitely in that in that vein of, like I said, I don't care what the poker world thinks. We're doing hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in sales. Uh, we're dominating the poker world. Even though the core poker community hasn't bought into what we're doing, we're making waves. Mm -hmm. And now Kai Willis makes a video. It's... I don't know. It just, it didn't bother me at all. What bothered me was them Tim Sheaf made a video. And I think this is still online. 
Is it? Fucking hell. Yeah. Tim Sheaf then made, I want to say it's a 15-minute video, but it might have been shorter, might have been longer. It was a pretty long video hmm. where he had this, where he then said a bunch of awful things. I think he called me a thief. I think he said I, he was, I was lying to children. He said some he said some things, and I was very pissed off at him and started a Facebook conversation and said, why are you saying these things, blah, blah, blah. So the Kai Willis video didn't bother me. A few years later, maybe two years later, I actually saw Kai at the NAPC at Origins in Canada. Mm -hmm. And he seemed kind enough. I mean, you know, I have my opinions of him, but you know, I didn't. I never held anything against Kai. It was Tim Sheaf that made the video that I felt <laughs> like it, it, it kind of like took it took Kai's gripes the way I saw it. And then it said it validated all of them in a negative sense. So mm. Kai's video might have been kind of humorous. Then Tim Sheaf is like, yeah, Adam's a thief. He's a robber. He's a liar. He's lying to kids. He's peddling product, you know, to, to take advantage of children. Like just awful stuff. But that's and Tim in a nutshell, isn't it? He, he always like gets, latches onto something and then he's goes super intense into that. Um, which he oh. himself has identified as like his a personality for like with veganism was super into it and then he's like right. oh I'm super against it and so more recently like he just went on the Stora podcast again he said he needs to try and kind of stop doing that a little bit because you know he's doing heavy into like one thing and then he rejects it and then he's heavy into something else so he probably bandwagoned a little bit onto that and was like oh fuck this guy you know and he does it all very publicly so I, yeah it's just you just hit the wrong end of, of Tim and kind of who he is. Oh, we got uh, 10 oh. minutes left on this, by the way. I didn't know that. All right, we'll wrap it up. I didn't know that. You have all this insight that I didn't know. You know, the English park horsing is something I never got involved with. I only know the guys who became really well-known. Mm -hmm. And I also don't know their personalities. I didn't meet most of these guys. So, yeah. So that was I, – I think after that, I remember seeing a video of someone burning a Take Flight shirt. <laughs> and I think, I think that's when negativity hit its high. And then also during that time, I was going through something really difficult in my life. And so it was so, it was so, yeah. all of that really hurt me because my heart was to build this company that supported tracers uh, in a profound way and in, in a direct way, in a financial mm. way. And then no matter what I did, it seemed like all I got was hate. Yeah. I moved to France to work with David. I thought people, I thought when I moved to France to work with David, people would say, oh my gosh, this is a guy who has a heart for parkour because who else would do that? And and that was turned against me. And so then here I am years later, it's like I can't do anything right, you know? And so that was that was pretty hurtful, I think, spiritually, emotionally for me. But I, I, I hate where you're coming from. Yeah. At the end of the day, we were still selling a lot of products. So at some level it was like, I just wanted to be respected. I heard Kobe Bryant say something one time, the late, you know, amazing Kobe Bryant. He said yeah. something like, what every professional wants is respect from his peers. Yeah. And I heard that and I said, this, I only heard this a couple of years ago. And I said, wow. I said, that's totally it. That's what I wanted is I think in some ways I was desperately trying to get the respect of the Parker world. Uh, Even in the beginning, when I bought TimSheaf.com and MarkTurok.com, it was from the mindset of I'm nothing. How do I get these amazing people to validate me? Uh, so I think if you look at it from a macro, that's that's like what I was was see was searching for was my place in the Parker world and. And it's like, no matter what I did, I couldn't get it. And so that was pretty disheartening. I, I can empathize with that, especially like I've done a few things in that vein. And this last year I worked on this film, got 60 people out to Bilbao, Spain, made this massive fucking film, released it. And it's like, it really feels like no one fucking cares. We done all right sales because we have guys from my team, Freerunning Schlappen in Germany, who have a large following. And so a lot of the fans of that team have bought the film. Um, you know, which and the money's all getting distributed between everyone. But in terms of the actual core parkour community, it really feels like no one gives a shit. And it's like, oh, fuck, you put in all this effort. And I, I could have put more effort into a film that would have been better for me as a filmmaker. But this one was for the community. And it's, it's hard doing things for the parkour community. They are a fairly ruthless bunch in terms of like... <laughs> <laughs> when you do things for them. So I can, I can empathize with that. But anyway, um, we, should, we should move on to, is it the last um, controversy yeah, here? the last one. Yeah, I don't, I don't like talking about it. I, uh, I mean, it's probably fair. 
Um, how do you say his name? I literally always forget. Who? Callum Powell? Callum. Callum Powell. Yeah. Callum. 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 Dude, I don't know how many, I can't tell you how many times someone's told me how to pronounce his name. I forget. That's funny. Yeah. This led to a tiff with him. And okay. so he's the type of person that I do recommend talking to just because he'll have an interesting perspective on all I will. This. I'm friends with Callum. I was like, I was on the Star Podcast recently, not talking about anything with you, but about the film and stuff. So I, I, I know Callum. I'll reach out to him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This led to a tip with him. So um, this is like, this is probably the dumbest thing I ever did, but I, I don't, I don't regret it from a personal perspective, but I do, I regret that other people know about it. Like if, if nobody okay. knew about it, I'd be like, that was really cool. But the fact that people know about it makes me really embarrassed. Okay. I started a website called supermodelgirlfriend.com. Okay. And um, how do I explain it simply? I was going through a really difficult time. There was this woman in, in my life and then she wasn't in my life. And so I started, the way I looked at it was some people, when they go through a really bad breakup, drink or they're on drugs or something. And what I decided to do was start this crazy website where I kind of vented metaphorically in writing articles, which I think is a pretty healthy way to deal with a difficult time in life. <laughs> but but it was perceived as something it, that it wasn't intended to be. And pretty much, pretty much what I did on this website is I wrote all these articles about how supermodels were totally crazy about me. And my thinking was that people would see it as a satire, right? right. But uh, they didn't. And uh, it's complicated. So anyway. It, <laughs> okay. It, Josh Dohe mentioned this in one of his recent things, like supermodel girlfriend, I'll never forget that. And right. then I wrote, I, wrote, I wrote one article and then uh, Callum, Callum posted it on his Facebook and said something like, you know, said something awful about it. And then I was like, dude, this is just a joke. It's a satire. And then he seemed super butthurt about it. So it was like that propagated <laughs> in the parkour community. Like Adam's doing his next crazy antic. He's this awful dude. He's totally arrogant. He's, I can totally see how people might have thought I was a narcissist because of certain things about the site. What, what, what was What's the goal of the website? Like what, why was it up there? Well, it was, it was weird. Like, um, what was the actual goal of the website? Yeah. There was like three or four different goals. Um, okay. I mean, one goal, my kind of one goal I always have is how do you go viral, right? How do you do something that catches the public's attention and become famous yeah. for and then leverage that into success in some way? So I kind of thought that the idea was an interesting idea. Obviously, I wrote it for entertainment. Obviously, I wrote it to heal. Another thing was that all the all the articles in the website were focused around a woman named Nina Agdal, who's a right. famous supermodel and was up and coming at the time. But if you go back on that website and you replace the Nina Agdal with this this woman who was in my life with her name, then it was a very personal thing to her. So okay. uh, it it was like some of it I was writing for her because I knew that she she was obviously an important person in my life, and so she was reading all the articles, and so. It had it had all these mixed ideas. I don't think it had a, a direct purpose. I think it was it was a crazy idea that I thought could work in some way, what way I wasn't sure. And so I wrote these articles. And I had a lot of fun creatively, you know, talking these really fun ideas that I felt like were, were comedic, but I just I just didn't understand comedy back then. So my execution <laughs> yeah. was really poor. So my, I mean, my comedic action Fair enough. <laughs> I mean supposed to be a that's like essentially, essentially, as far as the character thing is concerned, like sure that's weird, but it ha doesn't mean you're a bad person or have anything to do with parkour. So, like, nah, yeah, but, you know what I mean. But and again, I I had tried, and we're running out of time. I had I had tried, and this is what I think people felt, which is what led to some of this some of this whole fiasco, was that I never wanted to be the face of Take Flight. I okay. wanted to separate my personal life from the company. And I've realized that most founders don't do that. In fact, it's usually the opposite. You need yeah. to be the face of your company. Yeah. But yeah. I wanted Take Flight to be its own thing. I wanted the athletes to be the face. I wanted the brand to be the face. And so when I'm doing these things on the side, in my mind, they have nothing to do with parkour. Hmm. Nothing. Like, Take Flight never posted no. about the website. It wouldn't. No. It had nothing to do with parkour. No. But the parkour world sees it, and then they tie it into, oh, this is Adam who's doing these things. And so... Yeah.
It, All right, uh, so real quick, um, do you yeah. still train parkour as well, out of curiosity? Sometimes. You know, I had a, a pretty bad injury, oddly enough. I injured my wrist, which it makes no sense. I injured my wrist doing a back tuck. Like, go figure. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. landed on my feet, but I, I grabbed my, you know, my knees and something popped in my wrist. It's never healed, so I can't do climb-ups. And then I don't have health insurance right now. And so <laughs> I, yeah, fuck that. I avoid, I, I just think like, you know, I'm 37. Yeah. The last I thing I want to do is take a six foot drop and have my ACL go blop and say, well, you know, I just went yeah. bankrupt, you know? So I've, uh, and, uh, sorry, just because we're about to, we're, we're about to, fair, fair. Just because we're about to run out of time. Take flight. You still, is it still running? Is he still running the business essentially? Yeah. We're not gonna. We're gonna. I can't give you adequate answers with a with fifty nine seconds. Left. No, of course. But I just thought I'd ask. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Take flight's still running. We have an amazing shoe, the second gen Stealth Ultra X. Uh, okay. It's Great. an amazing shoe. People, Joey Adrian wears it. You know, a handful of people wear it. Christmas sales are always pretty good, so people around the country and world are buying the shoe. But Ooh. I have new visions for the company and uh, some new pivots I want to make. So. We'll see what happens fuck yeah i mean fuck yeah thank you so much man i really appreciate that and um we can continue to chat over online a bit and if you have any other things send through like a video of you just saying or something it, it would be fine you know what i mean thank you so yeah. much man appreciate this, is, it. this has been quite a pleasure max i wish we had talked more about you because you interest me more than i interest me you just oh well, we can have, have some... another call just a casual one at some point that's fine you know what i mean we should i would love Brilliant. to learn more about you and your projects